Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and in this series I'm going to take a look back at the various editions of Dungeons & Dragons, from those early wargaming days, to its rise in popularity, and through to today's modern iterations. This is going to be mostly an overview with some parts system review, so if you're already well familiar with the intricacies of the history of Dungeons & Dragons, you'll probably find that I've missed some trivia or events, but I'm going to do my best to present at least enough to serve as a basic guide for those who are just getting interested in the background of role-playing games, or players who want to see how things have changed over the years. But before we get into the true editions of Dungeons & Dragons, let's step back and take a look at where it all began. Wargaming, a concept developed during the 19th century, was made into a proper hobby during the early 20th, with the introduction of Jane's Naval War Rules and H.G. Wells' Little Wars. This popularity grew over the decades, and by the 1960s was expanded from simple rec recreation of existing historical battles to alternate sci-fi and fantasy rule sets. During the late 60s, one Gary Gygax, who had organized local wargaming clubs and founded the Lake Geneva Wargames Convention, or Gen Con, started developing wargaming rules inspired by his interest in the medieval and dark ages period. It was at the second Gen Con that he met Dave Arneson, who will figure into another formative concept behind the rise of role-playing gaming. Throughout 1970, Gygax formed other groups crucial to the eventual development of role-playing games, although at this time they were still wargaming groups at their core. Eventually, in 1971, Gygax released Chainmail, a tactical-level miniature war game set in the medieval period, originally with the help of Jeff Perrin. Chainmail not only included a 20-to-1 scale mass combat system, but also a 1-to-1 individual man-to-man -man combat system, as well as a fantasy supplement section which included rules for certain strange and unusual classic fantasy creatures, but also rules for magical weapons, air movement, and so forth. Chainmail was Gary Gygax's first commercial product, it was actually produced in a few editions and many printings throughout the 70s and early 80s, and can now be acquired through RPG Now as a PDF. Chainmail is often regarded as a direct predecessor to Dungeons & Dragons, but realistically it was missing much of what makes up a true role-playing game. In point of fact it is, even in its most expanded form, simply a combat system. And not only a combat system, but one which didn't last throughout the development of D&D, even though it was referenced in the very first version. However, it's important to cover here, largely because it is the one topic here that actually has a printed and published rulebook to reference, and thus we are left with a very accessible historical record of what Chainmail actually contained. Going off one of the later versions, we can see that it consisted of rules for medieval combat with modifiers for formations, fatigue, morale, weather, and sieges. This comprised about half of the book, with man-to-man -man and jousting rules taking a handful of additional pages, then the fantasy supplement the rest. A war game through and through, the combat is very simple, with dice rolled against unarmored, half-armored, or shield only, and then fully armored targets, with an all-or-nothing style casualty determination. Morale generally makes up a stronger component than it does in role-playing games. In the fantasy supplement, a lot of magical and special abilities simply operate similar to their equivalent in medieval weaponry. The rules are written by wargamers, for wargamers, and are a relatively dry read all in all, using terminology that will be familiar mostly to people with an experience in wargaming. However, the idea of adding fantasy to wargaming, as well as the reliance on the typical wargaming charts and man-to-man -man tactical rules, in general, the rule set was one part of what would eventually become role-playing gaming. During the late 60s time frame, another development in wargaming was occurring. This one relatively little known today compared to the stature of Gygax and Arneson's accomplishments. A man named David Wesley was running a war game set around a Napoleonic era of fictional German town of Braunstein. During this game, two players acted as commanders who would face off with the typical war game units, but other players would be brought in to run the goings-on of other important aspects of the town. Players would act as the town mayor or the banker, for instance, fulfilling non-military but important duties and introducing the idea that the player was in charge not of the actions of an entire army of nameless men, but just one character, the commander, or the banker, or the mayor, etc. Because the rules he was using were wargaming rules and not suited to one-to-one -one combat, 
when two individual characters challenged one another, he had to improvise the rules on the fly. While Wesley himself thought the idea was a failure, his players did enjoy it, and asked him to continue running these games. And so he refined the idea, including the role of a referee to serve not as one of the characters, but to be on hand to handle the consequences of those characters' actions, and he created a scenario where the players were attempting to stage or avert a coup in a Latin American country. He and Dave Arneson, and another member of his group, took turns running various iterations of this and related scenarios until Wesley was drafted into the army. This left Dave Arneson and other members of his group to continue this sort of referee role-playing war game style, through iterations including the Wild West, and eventually to fantasy realms such as the Lord of the Rings. While these started as individual scenarios, such as a war game might include, eventually the idea arose to allow his players to play the same character over multiple scenarios, allowing for the concept of each player having a persistent player character. And eventually Arneson adapted this style of play to run a game using Gygax's chainmail system, to allow his players to play individual characters in the fantasy barony of Blackmoor. While the character's focus might still be on wargaming scenarios and the barony at large, playing the part of medieval fantasy warriors, there was a component that allowed for something else. The individuals could explore the dungeons and tunnels beneath Castle Blackmoor. And thus, by the opening years of the 70s, the pieces were all in place. We had rules developed from wargaming and allowing for individual units to interact with fantasy creatures. We had the concept of multiple players playing individual roles, and those characters lasting from session to session. And finally, we had the very concept of delving into the depths and exploring as individual characters with a persistent history, allowing them to develop over time, their fortunes rising and falling based on their own actions. The stage was set for these concepts to combine officially into one rule set, and we'll take a look at the result of that in the next episode. For now, this has been the RPG Crawler, with my D&D Retrospective Part Zero. If you like what you've seen, please leave a like, comment if you've got feedback, and subscribe for more RPG content. If you want to help support this channel, or have a hand in shaping what you'd like to see coming up, please visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash rpgcrawler, or via the links at the end of the video or below. Until next time, take care and... Goodbye!